Welcome to Cyber Talk Radio. I'm your host, Brett Pyatt. And uh, this week, uh, we're going to be uh, talking with one of the founders of uh, Tech Block, uh, the CEO of Geek to Media today. Is that your current job title? Yes, one sir. of your current job titles? Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he uh, has uh, many other things that he's involved here across the uh, San Antonio community. I think we're going to have a uh, great conversation about um, entrepreneurship, building ecosystems, uh, building a story, uh, telling that story being part of a story, all those sort of kind of things. So if you're going to be able to stick with us here on the air, um, great. Uh, if you're in your car, uh, you can listen on your AM radio. If you're not in your car, you can listen via the iHeart radio streaming app on your Android iOS device or on your web browser at www.iheartradio.com. If you won't be able to stick with us for the whole program or if you happen to be tuning into a recording of this, uh, we'll put it up on our website at www.cybertalkradio.com on Tuesday, September 24th. And then it'll go out all across the internet on every podcasting service. Uh, So uh, you can listen there. If you have a podcasting service that you prefer uh, to use where you do not see CyberTalk Radio, uh, please reach out to us on Facebook or Twitter. Let us know. We'll fix that. And we'll we'll even get you an exclusive CyberTalk Radio t-shirt. So uh, with that, my guest today is uh, Lorenzo Gomez. So Lorenzo, thank you for joining us. Oh, I'm 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 beyond honored to be here. Yeah, uh, this is uh, it, it's kind of fun. We we started this program three years ago. Um, we it's been three years. It's been three years. Yeah, wow. the this the building we were in was still <laughs> partially empty, quite a bit empty, I guess. And the the neighborhood here around Geekdom, the scaffolding was still up, st- still up. Geekdom Media did not exist. That's right. Yes. Yeah, so when right. did when did you guys start Geekdom Media? Uh, I would probably say about uh, fourteen, fifteen months ago. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So brand yeah, new baby. It wasn't even an idea. Probably. Yeah. It wasn't three even years a ago. twinkle. Yeah. It, so it's 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 fairly new. Yeah. Uh, you know. And but but I feel like you have been leading the charge in the original the original content space with Cyber Talk Radio. So it's really I'm I'm super pumped to be here. Yeah. I mean as as we put this together originally I wanted to get all of the cybersecurity CEOs in the area downtown. That worked. because um, many of them have companies spread out all over and they hadn't seen what was going on down here mm. at Geekdom. Mm. The second one is where we're uh, almost uh, within we're certainly within walking distance but uh, or scootering distance of City Hall. Uh, but it's, it, get those folks uh, over there in, in our city and county and, and everyone in this business community here downtown aware of all the cybersecurity stuff going on in San Antonio. And then the, the third one was to uh, get parents and kids uh, aware that if you'll pay attention a little bit in school, learn some cybersecurity stuff, maybe join a cyber patriot team, that there's all kinds of careers mm, for you right. in the San Antonio area. Uh, that third one's certainly an ongoing uh, mission, and we'll we'll continue to promote the podcast. But the the first couple we've uh, kind of knocked out of the park, I think, at this point. Oh yeah, well, and, and even in the third one, you know, you've got Cast Tech right up the road, and they're yeah. they look in our direction for inspiration, but also for curriculum and opportunities. So. Yeah, and I mean, with the support of Cyber Texas Foundation, our Cyber Patriot uh, program here in the San Antonio area is the largest in any metro in the U.S., and we are not the largest metro in the U.S. <laughs> We might be the seventh, <laughs> sixth or seventh largest city, but we're not the sixth or seventh largest metro. Either. Right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, square mile, maybe, you know, but that's, you know, that's yeah. not the one we're proud of. Yeah. So what led you guys to to start Geekdom Media? We were doing this podcast and uh, for like a year and a half or whatever. There was not a lot of other audio content going on, even video content yeah, around yeah. here. Well, I it was a it was a couple of things. The first one being um, at the time I was I was still CEO of Geekdom and and running 8020 but i always say i was not running both of them well you know there's a saying you can't serve two masters and so I, most of my focus was on geekdom and uh, so during that time i was writing my first book Slauncher diaries and while i was writing it i was also finishing the biography of walt disney by, by neil gabler uh which jason strong's a huge fan of uh, yeah and and one of the things that i you know that whole book is about how walt disney was in the content was in the original content business, but specifically he created not to quote Bill Schley, but uh, he created two categories. He was the first person to, to put, uh, uh, to put noise to animation and then color. And so he created this category of content that just never existed before. And he was in this, this space of creation that really changed the world. And, and I thought to myself, you know, he did, he did original content in this way that was so unique. And, so many people started moving to California just be, I mean, he was the original Steve Jobs, right? He was there yeah. 
and all of the great minds of tech in that day around animation wanted to be there. And so I just started thinking, you know, if you think about the places that are really famous in tech, they are also known for uh, ideas and the and the people with ideas. You know, you go to Silicon Valley because, you know, back in the day you knew Zuckerberg was there and Steve Jobs was there and these great idea people were there. And I remember reading the famous Reddit where Tim Ferriss moved to Austin. And I thought that was such a huge you know, idea coup d'etat from Silicon Valley because he moved away because he thought that it was better of an idea place. Uh, He didn't outright say it that way, but but that's what I interpreted was, I'm going to go to Austin because it's it's this place full of, you know, this kind of blank canvas of ideas. And so I said, you know, San Antonio has just as many great idea people as any other city that I know of. We just do a bad job of marketing it. And so we do not tell our story well at all. And I said, well, I want to I want to put together a company that starts creating original content so we can become famous for this. So that was that was my long winded answer to your question. But yeah. I do think we need more original content. No, I mean, I, it's a, an interesting one in, in San Antonio is uh, you, you look at our market. And if you're listening nationwide, um, there's been uh, a history of entrepreneurship in San Antonio. Yes. Um, like. We're, I think, the only major metro in the U.S. where uh, there's only uh, two two major grocers here, uh, <laughs> H-E-B, which is headquartered in San Antonio, and then Walmart. And every other national grocery chain that's tried to come to market yep. has turned around Run and out left. of town. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and even even you go across uh, other areas in like Denny's. How many Denny's locations are there in town? Two or three, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Because there's Jim's Diner all over town, and right. like you go through all of these right. different things. Um, and I've hit a couple of food examples, but uh, it, there's a ton of them where in San Antonio, someone started up their own sort of better version of things here. That's right. Um, and I think have built a, a solid life, a solid business, and then just decided to stop growing. Like they haven't <laughs> gone to try to take over right. the whole world. HEB is pretty big, but they're still just yeah. uh, in Texas. Yeah. it's. I think it's the largest privately held uh, either company or at least grocer uh, in the country, but to your point, you know they specialize and said, "Hey, we're just going to own this region yeah. and world domination, you know, whatever." But in this area, we own it and own it. They do, yes, and they're very famous in their in their category. And I think you're right, but I think that there's a little bit of the I call it the Greg Popovich, ah uh, shucks, we don't brag about ourselves. You know, yeah. it's, it's kind of considered you know snobbish or, or or arrogant, and I and I love it, right? We love that there's no chest pounding, but I also think it really hurts us marketing wise because we do not proclaim the things that we are superlative in to attract really exciting people and really intelligent. And there's a lot of brilliant people here, but we don't do a good job of creating the excitement around bringing them because we have that. No, 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 we we don't want the spotlight. And so I'm very torn by it because I, you know, I love it. But on one hand, I'm like, Hey man, you got to say when you're the best because people want to know they're part of the winning team. Yeah. Uh, and and you, so across, I mean, our tech industry has been here for a long time. There was a company called Data Point Corporation, and for listeners out there, uh, go check out the Wikipedia page or not. But they they invented this uh, processor chip, the Data Point Corporation, uh, called the eight oh oh eight. And then I think then some licensing stuff happened to this uh, company called Intel, and uh, <laughs> off it goes from there. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but it, but it was, it was yeah. it created here, created yeah, in San Antonio, yeah, first. created in San Antonio, uh, and uh, all sorts of uh, yeah other research things as well coming out of Southwest Research on the the west side of town. It's a, I mean, a huge research facility, tons and tons of PhDs out there doing. Um, all, or or yeah. how about this one the the famous South by Southwest triangle the, the napkin yeah right that that uh, that Herb Kelleher wrote was at the St Anthony Hotel downtown yeah. you know the the what was it da- Dallas Houston San Antonio yeah was that the triangle yeah but you know these are these this is the story that the 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 legendary lore that we don't talk about because no. we're we're very humble but I think that that and there's a way to do it where you don't come off like a jerk yeah. And I think that's what San Antonio is afraid of. But I do think this is one of the great, uh, one of our one of our great uh, Achilles' heels is marketing, uh, marketing ourselves. So, no, I mean, it, it, totally, it, and it, it's a challenge out there, especially these days. The internet's becoming a very noisy place. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, going back a little bit in, in your background as well, I think uh, just on the education innovation side um mm-hmm. there's all this stuff now with charter schools and in-district charter programs and in-district magnet programs but san antonio's been doing that for a while as well yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so i when when i was in middle school 
I went to a middle school called Tafoya, which was the first magnet, uh, one of the first magnets in the in the city. And it was a multilingual program where you had to get accepted. You have to have good enough grades and you could learn a foreign language. And uh, and so I, that's where the Castro brothers went, where Diego Bernal, our state rep, went. Um, actually, there's a lot of people um, in, in that are kind of in the in the city moving and shaking. Uh, I'm not one of them. I, you know, I, I was, you know, the, the C team, yeah. but, but it was, it was really special. And when, it, when I got accepted, it was, I thought it was, you know, greatest thing. And then I went to health careers high school, which was, you know, the first, it, you know, I don't even know what the, what, what it would have been classified as back then, but it was free. You had to get accepted. So it was sort of an yeah, in district charter for Northside or something. Yeah. And, um, and so I was the beneficiary of these special programs. And now there's so many of them, which, which I'm so grateful for. Um, because it's really about options. You know, there's, there's the politics of it. There's, you know, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of feelings, but I think that the parents really don't care about the politics. The parents, a parent just wants the absolute best thing for their child. And if they don't have to pay a thousand, you know, a jillion dollars a month then even better. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, we've had many, uh, the, uh, kids and teachers and faculty and folks on from Cast Tech High School, which is a, a software and entrepreneurship focused school, um, just a few blocks away from where we're recording this, that's uh, right. Kind of first one in the nation to offer a user experience and design course um, yeah. and yeah, all sorts of cool stuff going on. And I mean, for parents out there listening uh, now, you used to have to apply. And uh, many of these now are open lottery enrollment. So right. just go check it out and, and you can get in there and you're they're going to teach at the level that every student is at. And they've That's actually right. found out that this generates better outcomes for all of the students, uh, regardless of where they are along that progression curve. Well, it's, you know, what's so fascinating, Brett is I, when I, when I talk to people, when I'm selling San Antonio, which is one of, I think my major job functions, it's really cool for me to be able to tell them when it comes to education reform, we are in the mix. San Antonio is doing things that are so cutting edge and innovative. And there are other, you know, if you think about education reform, do you think about, you know, the famous documentary Waiting for Superman and, you know, Nashville's really big in it. And there's there's all these places. But we are we are we are doing just as much, if not more than most cities in in the, the area of education reform. And so if I was in education reform, I would get on a plane and come to San Antonio and study it because yeah. there is there is no other place. I mean, there are very few places that are doing it. And I think that's really exciting. It's another industry where we are doing really great things. But again, we just don't market it. And so we, you know, people don't know that there are really, there's thought leadership in a lot of these places that we have here. And I think we should be really proud of that. Yeah. So I guess when, and I'm going to bounce all over yeah, the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. conversation today. Yeah. Uh, uh, for your listening to 1200 WAI, and this is Cyber Talk Radio, um, joined by Lorenzo Gomez today. He's got a bunch of different jobs and a, a wide background. If you just uh, go... Uh, Google Lorenzo Gomez uh, author. You'll get the one of the book he, uh, he's written. Uh, depending on when you're listening to this, book two may be out. It's coming right. out uh, October ish of uh, <laughs> of 2019. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So because they could be listening to this in 2027. So we're gonna have to see how timeless <laughs> our words are. Because once they go out there in the podcast world on the internet, it's our forever. words are there forever. Yeah. yeah. You're gonna look back and go, man, did I really say that while I was on that program. <laughs> Uh, so, so when you were uh, so had gotten involved at the start of Geekdom, you were living here downtown uh, for yeah. a while. And uh, so, what transformation have you seen? Like, if, if there's, it, and maybe transformation is not the right word, uh, but like, what have you seen from then to to now uh, in in the the change in downtown? Oh my gosh, where do I even start? So when I when I first started working downtown. Uh, on downtown, I was I was executive director of the eighty twenty foundation, which is the private philanthropy of Graham Wesson, who was one of the owners of Rackspace or the major, majority shareholder. Yep. Shareholder, and so we w- we were investing in urban grants, so parks and you know urban amenities and entrepreneurship, and so that's when I started studying urban things and going to so cities. Was and the St. Books. Anthony Hotel closed when you first came back downtown? Yeah. Uh, Yes. Okay, yes, it was. Yeah, so Travis Park was not Travis cleaned Park, up yet. No, Travis. Okay. Yeah, it was. It was. There were a lot of reasons to not come downtown. Okay. And uh, it was really sort of a wasteland. Um, so many buildings were empty. I would say most of the buildings were empty, and 
it was it was unsafe. And this was after AT and T had moved their headquarters to yes. out of downtown yes. to Dallas. So like this is post AT and T being here. Yes. And the kind of and this is a situation many of the downtowns are going through in in metros all across the the country. You have a, a major employer that is the anchor of yes. that area, and that company either struggles or that company relocates and moves, and then you're left with this this hole to fill in. Yeah. Well, and also I think that there 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 was probably a several decades where we just suburbanized the country. The country yeah. went suburban. And so the, the, our story was played out in many cities where the urban centers just emptied. And so when we started working, specifically when I started working, it was in uh, 2011, and it was dead. And Mayor Julian Castro at the time had launched an initiative called SA 2020, and he was working on you know, downtown. And then there's the famous, there's the famous email that Graham always tells, which yeah. got him kind of into the mix. And it was, uh, and, but it was dead. And so, you know, Julian said, and I, actually I remember Graham telling me about a conversation where he said, hey, Julian, you know, M- M- Mayor, you have, to, you have to do certain things if you want downtown to become alive again. Yeah, and that short version of that email for our listeners is uh, uh, Rackspace acquired a company headquartered out of the East Coast, and one of the founders said, I'll move to Texas, but I won't move to San Antonio. So, like, yeah, never, period. ever, ever. <laughs> ever, ever, ever. Here's all the things wrong with your city. Yes, yeah, and sent it in an email, and 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 Graham actually forwarded that email to, to Mayor Castro and said, "Mayor, this is the city we have to build yeah. if we ever want our young people to either stay or move, consider moving back." Yeah, and uh, and I, you know, I know that you and I can both attest from our Rackspace hiring days that you know back in the day, hiring people in certain demographics are harder. Young and single, oof, hard, yeah, hard, 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 impossible. Because we just did not have the value proposition that they needed. And I think that it, this is a lesson for a lot of cities. If you are a city that's not a first-tier city, you are, you are probably going to struggle to hire young single people because they are looking for quality of life things. A job offer, a great job offer, a salary, the soda machine doesn't matter those are table stakes yeah right well, especially with the nationwide unemployment below four percent right now right. it's not like that they're struggling to find right. a job right and so you know go, you know going back to your question when i came down here what i realized was there was you had to have a real reason to be downtown and there was no real reason if you didn't work for the city and so i was very inspired by graham's mission to kind of revitalize downtown and to do uh, to do to San Antonio, to have Rackspace do to San Antonio what Dell did to Austin. Yeah. And so he launched the 8020 Foundation Geekdom and Western Urban as sort of his way of doing it. And then we started studying cities. So he he made me go to Vegas to meet with Tony Shea and the downtown project, see what they were doing. We went to Detroit. We went everywhere. I went. Crazy I Mama mean, Park. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 uh, the, uh, the shipping container park with the big praying mantis from you know yeah. Burning Man and and we and we learned a lot from them. I mean, we took principles from each one, each ecosystem back here. You know, I remember I remember one from Tony Shea was that you know he said you know our job is to create the conditions for the serendipitous collision of ideas to happen. And yeah. I just thought that really influenced, especially when I was CEO of Geekdom. Um, but Dan Gilbert, Dan Gilbert is doing the same thing in Detroit, and it's back. I mean, he has done a really great job. But I think the answer to your question was downtown was dead. There was no reason. There was no quality of life amenities to make it attractive. And so Geekdom became, through Graham and Nick Longo, it became the seed that they planted. Uh, that became a destination and started creating this gravitational pool. And I think what, what I discovered was people wanted to be excited about a tech scene because nobody that, that their, when their life situation says you have to live in San Antonio, then you want to make the most of it. Yeah. And so all of those people said, man, I, I want to be a part of a tech scene. And it ge- Geekdom gave them a way to participate. And I think it accelerated so fast um, for a lot of different reasons. But I think Graham and Nick really you know, planted in fertile ground because there's just so many reasons to not come downtown, right? There's, you know, the park, parking and, you know, there's a lot yeah, I mean, of... Back, back when you started that, I think there was a, a stat and some fact checker out there on the radio confirm, confirm or deny this for me. You let us know on Facebook or Twitter, but that the uh, only reason that half of the San Antonio residents would go inside the 410 loop on an annual <laughs> basis would be for, for jury duty. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah the that's... other the other time they would stay outside the 410 loop and many folks would stay outside the 1604 loop. So like even if for, for those not familiar with San Antonio geography, the... The 410 loop is a freeway roughly centered around downtown, and it's That's probably right. a f- 
20 miles on the full loop for 410 yeah. maybe yeah. if you could drive the whole 410 loop somewhere around 20 miles then the 1604 loop actually isn't a whole loop. Uh, we're a little. It's, it's mostly there <laughs> yeah. now, but it's 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 almost a loop. It's yeah. better than Loop 360 in Austin, which is not a loop at all. <laughs> uh, and and that one's probably a 60 mile it's, loop. It's yeah, it's insane. a big it's a big yeah. loop, and it's it's uh, from downtown to the 1604 loop is in a straight line. So the yeah. the radius is probably 15 miles on that. So yeah, well, and and so it was it was dead. Yeah. And so there were some city things that, that Mayor Castro did. There were some entrepreneurial things that Graham did. But it really started a, a story, yeah. right? an exciting story. So uh, with, with Geekdom, so uh, starting off a co-working space in a dead area focused on a tech scene without a bunch of tech <laughs> things going on around it. No university downtown at that point in time. Now you've got UTSA coming down here in a bigger way. UTSA had a tiny campus with architecture and public policy on the west right. side of downtown. Right. But no residential housing, no students really living on campus there and things when you started doing this. So how do you go from a story and an idea like Geekdom, we're going to build a tech co-working community to actually get it off the ground? It's <laughs> like it, it, for, for the, going from zero to, to one, like who was the first like the first member? Like who, somebody walks in here and they have to be the one to join and then wait around for member number two to show up. Well, I think um, I think that the an- the first the an- part one answer to that question yeah. was Nick Longo did a great job when he started Geekdom. Uh, he just did a great job of marketing this notion that we're start we're kickstarting the tech scene, and so he threw a series of really just kind of community uh, events just to get it out there. And I think the answer to your question was there was such a pent up demand. People were there were people that were desperate to be in community. And I think that's the other part of the answer is, you know, Nick and Graham based the whole thing on community, being in community, get members giving back. And people were very starved for that. And so, boom, the first probably, you know, 50 members were well, pretty easy. Yeah. You know, I mean, you had, you had, to, you had to sell them, but they, they, they ultimately craved a startup community. And I think that a good entrepreneur like Graham and Nick identified this gap in the market. Yeah, it's like I look at like Capital Factory and the growth they've had up in Austin, and like mm-hmm. they started. I think they're still in the Omni building, uh, but they have like probably That's half right. of the floors yeah. in that building now. They'd, yeah. they'd they'd started and gotten one floor that it, that was in a, a downtown that was already pretty connected and happening in the middle of a big university that actually had residential housing and everything right in that area. And, right, right. Um, and and so like. But they didn't start Capital Factory. I feel like it did started somewhere similar. Maybe a it few started years. after Geekdom. It did start after Geekdom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say similar. Because I remember frame. Josh Bear came uh, when Nick was when Nick was CEO to yeah. come study, and he was doing he was doing his due diligence just like we were. Um, but I think that there were also a couple of tactics. See, Graham has this great uh, this great principle uh, that he always reminds me of. Is he says, Lorenzo, we're after tactics, not strategies. You know, because the, we already know the strategy, right? Get downtown, get the get the get the, the scene started. It's yeah. the tactics at work. So we had an operations director, uh, the famous Kara Kennedy, and I remember uh, she did something really brilliant where she called all the tech meetups uh, one day on Meetup.com and said, "Hey, if you have your meetup here at Geekdom, we'll we'll sponsor your pizza and beer." And we went from zero to twenty five tech meetups overnight. And I think it was this notion of phase two of growing the ecosystem was going out and selling, going out and recruiting and saying, we're doing something special. We have this mission. Come be a part of it. And I think that's what fa- that carried phase two. So after you got all those tech meetups down, you kind of got the first members, got that, that growth going on into this second phase. Um, how's the kind of transition? So this is another one. Maybe we'll, we'll talk more about this sure. uh, after, after our bottom of the hour break here for news, traffic and weather update, which is uh, coming shortly for listeners that have tuned in and are uh, waiting to, uh, to hear that it's the end of September. So it may be rainy. It may be hot, um, <laughs> uh, but it yeah. may not be uh, too many other things. <laughs> so uh, you go from that growth phase up to kind of where you, you reach the sustaining point in a market mm. Um and and so as I think about people, you've got innovators that come up and get the, the first thing going. You've got um, folks that enjoy that scale and growth journey. And then you've got the optimizers that are going to take the thing after it's there and mature. Um, do you feel like we're in the optimize phase with Geekdom right now? Or is there still more growth to be had? No, I think it's a. Uh... Yeah, I think I think it's definitely scale and optimization, which is how do we make sure that the process is repeatable, that the experience is great. You know, I and, and the the perfectionist in me, all I ever see is things that can be improved on. And but I'm a I'm a 
I'm a pioneer. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm an early adopter, and so my skills are only very potent at the you, very beginning. Yeah, you you live in the innovate phase. Yeah, and so I, and so it was very it was it was very important for me to figure out when I needed to get out of my way, and uh, and and so thankfully we have really great you know people that are ops ops specialists. But I think that the ecosystem. I don't think the ecosystem is an optimization phase. No. I think that it is still several phases behind where we need to hustle and sell vision. Uh, sell the vision on where we're going to recruit more people to our merry band of misfits down here. Yeah. You're listening to Cyber Talk Radio on 1200 WA, and we'll be right back after this news, traffic, and weather update. Welcome back to Cyber Talk Radio. I'm your host, Brett Pyatt, a 20-year internet security veteran. Uh, I'm joined this week by Lorenzo Gomez, CEO of Geekdom Media, chairman of Geekdom, the co-working community and tech entrepreneurship hub here in downtown San Antonio. Uh, let's see, you also uh, are the executive director of the 8020 Foundation. What's your 8020 Foundation? I'm, I'm on the board. You're yeah. on the board there. Oh, you don't have no more day job responsibilities <laughs> than that one either. Uh, yeah, you're learning well from your, your mentor. Uh, and then uh, yeah, one of the founders of Tech Block, writing some books now, the uh, author of Cilantro Diaries, uh, kind of a, a great history and background on Lorenzo and his uh, journey through the first, what, about 35 years of your life on that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, check that one out on Amazon. Uh, it's a great place to buy it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he gets paid if you buy it from there. <laughs> well, yeah. Amazon takes most of it, but I'm okay Most with of it. Oh, yeah. the, you, yeah. you still get a little bit. That's yeah. good. As, as my mentor said, it's all about getting the ideas out there. Okay, and then, yeah, you've got second book coming out here uh, before the Christmas shopping season. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, follow him as an author there, and you'll get the little notice when that author publishes another book. So... Um, we were talking all, uh, all a whole bunch of things in the first half of the program, and then some good conversation there during that news, traffic, and weather update at the bottom of the hour. I'm going to jump to something that kind of came to me as a thought um, during that break. So San Antonio grew up here, um, mm-hmm. and then you had an opportunity working uh, for Rackspace, a tech company here, to go live outside of San Antonio for a couple yeah. of years. So you, you lived in London, mm-hmm. and you actually came back. Yeah. So my, my experience <laughs> has been... And and this is before you built the the tech community that we have down here now with Geekdom to to, to be a place to come back to. Like yeah, when yeah. when you went from Rackspace to London, basically there was Rackspace in San Antonio, and then there we've always had cybersecurity companies kind of scattered all around town, mm-hmm. but there mm-hmm. wasn't really a core community. There was Rackspace, some other cybersecurity companies scattered around town, and that was it. Right. And so you, you went over to London, one of the world's most vibrant and dynamic metros, mm, yeah. and then. You came back. So, what was that experience like? And what as, as you you went out there, and then what brought you you back here? Well, you know, the the opportunity to go to London was so terrifying because I like a lot of like a lot of uh, you know sons and daughters of San Antonio. I had never left a thirteen mile radius, thirteen block radius of my house. Yeah. And Rackspace put me on the second plane of my life to London, uh, to London Heathrow, and it really it really changed my life. Uh, you know. That was the that first airport's a little bigger than our one here in San Antonio. <laughs> There's a million people every day, yeah. at least back, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah. So who knows what it is now? Yeah. And I just remember being so overwhelmed in, in, a, in, a, in a childlike curiosity way of all these people from all these countries. And it really was very inspiring to me. I remember the, from the first two weeks meeting some, you know, you, you could meet someone from a war torn, dictator led country. Um, you know, that's just getting just, you know, skewered in the news. And they'll say, yeah, but you know what? We, we have an evil dictator, but you know, we grow the best strawberries in the whole world. And, and the principle is everybody's proud of where they come from. Yeah. And I was very proud to come from San Antonio, but I think that it was my first lessons. I didn't know it at the time. It was my first lessons in urbanism. And so I didn't have a car when I was there. I walked, I took the tube, I took the, the train everywhere, um, took the Eurostar to France and really traveled. And but one of my realizations was London and a lot of these big metropolises are fifth gear cities. I mean, you move fast, you talk fast. It's very transactional in a lot of ways. Hey, what, what, who are you? What can you do for me? What can I do for you? And I realized in London that I'm a third gear kind of guy. <laughs> I, I sort of want to stroll. Now, I can walk fast, and I did for three years, but I realized I like taking the time to pause and and stroll and that's just who I am yeah. and and so I went San Antonio is a third gear city we just we're stroll and also we're very relationship based and so you you cannot get away in San Antonio with a business relationship where you skip the how is your mom I heard she's sick 
what hospital is she in? Uh, you know, I need to go visit her. These things really matter. And I think it's what makes us special. And I think it's part of what we all, we're all afraid we don't want to lose that part of our city, the relationship. As it continues to grow, yeah. As it continues to grow. I think it's one of our core values. But I do think that I got back and thought, oh my gosh, I'll give you a great example. That one of my, uh, one of my best friends in London, who was one of my number one man crushes, was a Norwegian guy named Jan Anderson. And he was this brilliant Norwegian guy. He ran our data center. He was a self-taught programmer, you know, taught himself SQL Server in like two weeks and spoke five languages. And he, he was 30 at the time, had never driven a car, had never lived in a city where he had owned it. He, so he'd never driven a car, period. Yeah. He, his bike was his primary mode of transportation. And I remember the first time I, I realized this, I was so awestruck. I was like, wait, you don't have a car? He was like, no, I ride my bike. And I was like, like, that's your, like, your bike's your car? He said, yeah. And I thought in my head, in my neighborhood, that just means you're poor. But like it just means you can't afford it. Yeah. And but this guy was cho- very educated, choosing to have his side. And and what depressed me, Brett, was I knew instantly then I could never recruit this guy to, to the city I love. You know, I, I could never say, please come, just give San Antonio a try, because he because he we would fail the first test. Can he get around with no car? Yeah. Fail. And so I think that I came back home very much inspired to help San Antonio get the things that I think we need that places like London have. Because I think as we grow, I mean, what's the stat? There's like a million to million point two people moving here in the next 15 years. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. I mean, we're, I mean, we're going to gain of the low end 50,000 a year, maybe yeah. the high end, maybe a hundred thousand a year, what through just natural population growth and, and the net of the immigration and emigration. Right. And so, so if you, if you take those numbers, you think about every neighborhood, like you can't, you're going to add 50,000 cars, you yeah. know, uh, it, it, the infrastructure won't be able to handle it. Um, you're going to add 50,000 houses a year. We need we need dense, you know, condos, apartments, which is not very San Antonio. We need other forms of transportation. You can't just add lanes. right? You're, it's, yeah. it's just proven that you're not going to add lanes, you know. And so we, yeah, we you, live you in can. This... We can end up with the 405 freeway in L.A. <laughs> yeah. uh, where it's 12 lanes wide yeah. or whatever. Or the I-10 freeway in Katy. And it's yeah. Yeah, 12 lanes wide. And it's, of still, nothing. Yeah. it's still slow during rush hour. And and I think that London really changed my view of, of what it means to live in a dense city. Yeah. And I think yeah, that... There's a place that's not great to drive. Uh, for, oh. for fans out there, if you want to wonder what it's like to drive in London, uh, <laughs> just... Uh, this will be out there on on the internet somewhere but a uh, top gear who's a, a show on the bbc <laughs> yes. they did a a race around london where they had the staff uh, one of the folks in the show tried to drive the london marathon route um and they had a marathon runner run the marathon route <laughs> and the marathon runner finished before the car did so 26.2 <laughs> mile loop around the that's streets awesome. of london and the guy was able to run it faster than the car that's not that's, even a bike just running just it. running just yeah. you know go do yeah. it and but that but it, it's such a dramatic story, but it's so true. It's painfully true. Of that's wh- that's where we're headed as a city if we do not plan. And and I'm very thankful, you know, that we have, you know, the bond project has a lot of really you know forward thinking things. I think yeah. the judge, the judge, you know, if you're out there, judge, thank you for you know he's he's been pushing all these you know very progressive uh, uh, projects. You know, mission reach, change the city. But I do think that we need to be prepared. We're not prepared for what is coming and what does all that have to do with tech? And I always say everything. Yeah. You know, the things that, that affect tech have nothing to do with tech. It's quality of life. You know, right now there are a hundred young people moving to New York, even though it's the most expensive city I've ever heard of, yeah. but because of the quality of life, things available to them and the career things available to them, it makes it worth the price tag. And so the question San Antonio needs to ask in any tier two, tier three city is what are we doing to be worth the move? Yeah. And a lot of that is not right. Adding another mall, <laughs> you know, no. that that's not how you're going to do it. Or, you know, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we love to do it with amenities or, or you're not going to do it with a tax abatement, right? You're not going to give a tax abatement and, and win the winning, you know, the, the, the winning ecosystem. You have to do it with quality of life. Yeah. So uh, I guess so what's a, as you, you look at, at spending some time in London, if there's like one mistake that they've made that we could avoid making here because mm. we haven't grown to that size or scale yet, anything that comes to mind? 
Oh man, I, the list of positives is way longer. They, yeah. do, they do districts better than us, right? You you know you go to Brick Lane. Yeah, like every is, every neighborhood has its own high street. Has You've got its a little own bit of shots. Yeah, the pedestrian experience. It's super walkable. You have districts. You have a theater district. You have a, an Indian curry district. You have art districts. I mean, you have you have the infrastructure, and I think that cities need to pay better attention to how do you how do you create dense districts where you know where a, a person or a family can just get out of the car once yeah and do many things that's ultimately what people want and when you go to cities like london you know i think that you know they're i think they could do a better job for entrepreneurs i uh, for small businesses i i think that one of the things that i that bummed me out was how fast small businesses went out of business that would really bum me out because you'd have a really you know, and, and, and I always thought to myself, how did this guy go into business? His storefront was like 600 square feet. Like he didn't, he couldn't have had a lot of inventory to start with. Yeah. And so I think they could have better infrastructure for things like that. Yeah. For entrepreneurship. Yeah. So yeah, you see, you, you would think, yeah, in, in a city of that size. And I mean, we have a problem with declining entrepreneurship all across the, the U S right now as well. Yes. Uh, Big so time. yeah, if, if we don't actively do things to promote and encourage entrepreneurship, well, we could end up in that same spot for sure. Yeah. When I think that's the power of an entrepreneurial ecosystem is that um, most people who are entrepreneurs are not going to get encouragement from their friends and family, right? Yeah. Your mom is not. Your mom is not telling you, "Hey, oh. forego that four hundred one k and forego that, steady, that, that steady job from a big yeah, company and go get all that risk and you know and and asking yourself, am I going to make payroll? Just give me grandkids. That's what they want. And so you know. M- an entrepreneur needs a community of other entrepreneurs that are on the risky journey that they're on. Yeah. And I think that in, in very dense nodes of cities, that's what you get. And I think that's what most cities need to be. That's what the essence of geekdom is having a community where people can chase their dream together because most people are going to tell them don't do it. Yeah. So we're uh, almost, I guess this is, we're sneaking up on nine years for geekdom. So it's almost the first yeah. decade. Yeah. Uh, and, and we've got this spread out, um, tech ecosystem now i can think if i walk up and down in kind of this five block area here in downtown there's a tech company in every building now uh and we can see some of the things that are going to happen over the next decade already utsa has made the announcement oh, of huge. the downtown campus downtown housing expand uh, downtown campus expansion downtown housing Ten thousand school students of, school of data science the national um security collaboration center uh School of Business moving some programs down here uh, related to cybersecurity, uh, all sorts of things that we already know are going to happen. Uh, see any anything you want to think that is going to happen that we aren't thinking about right now? I I think that the, that it's so funny. This this is going to be the most non tech answer I ever give anybody. Yeah, we need entertainment and nightlife. Yeah, and I'm not saying that as a bachelor, even though. Part of me wants to say, yes, we need that. But I think that, you know, uh, there is a Harvard economist who wrote a book uh, called Triumph of the City, and he has a whole chapter in his book about marriage markets. And I just think that San Antonio's brand is normally family town only. And we're so spread out that there is no dense, there's no dense node for young people to congregate. And you go to 6th Street, I challenge anybody to try to name a bar. Remember the name of a bar on 6th Street. You can't. You just go there because you know there's... 10,000 other young people there. And so I think that what what our ecosystem needs specifically is we need to have a place where where you can imagine yourself being young and single or or being newly married like dual income no kids, right? Yeah. And so right now we are just woefully inadequate with infrastructure for those two populations. And I think we need it it, because the tech community is going to be recruiting those two populations heavily, and we just don't have a good value proposition for them. Yeah, I mean, I think as as close as we we get to that is once a month we have First Friday in Southtown. Right. And that's as close as we get to that that that's right you but know, but it's not yeah nightlife yeah where it's like you know you 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 know to, not to not to pick on austin but rainy yeah. street and sixth street they they have they have contiguous right businesses that yeah. just cater to this population and yeah. the results are amazing yeah and they're walkable and they're wa- <laughs> yes that, you're not getting back zone, in your car z- zoning doesn't require a parking space for every 400 square feet of retail <laughs> that's yeah. exactly right so it, yeah that's what we need that's yeah. that's my answer okay yeah so is that going to happen downtown here in the next decade? Well, I think that 
I think through Cyber Talk Radio, we're going to put it into the universe. And, yeah. and you know. Yeah. If you're an entrepreneur out there and you wanted to make a bunch of money, yeah. I, if you could solve that in downtown, yes. you would make as much money as everyone on 6th Street or yes. everyone on Rainy Street makes. Or Attention uh, real estate people. Wink, yeah. wink. Yeah. Please. It's solve this. Solve this. It, it you, you will get your money in return, no doubt. You're listening to 1200 WAI. This is Cyber Talk Radio, and I've been joined by Lorenzo Gomez, a uh, man of many talents, uh, the author of Cilantro Diaries, uh, author of another book. We, can we, we can't share the title even yet, can we? Not yet. Not no, yet. Not but soon. Yet. But soon. Not yet soon. So the, what's the easiest place for them to go? Like, do you have a Lorenzo Gomez author website or some like where what's the easiest place for them to find out about when this book comes out? Uh, probably if you just follow me on uh, the socials, Twitter, the, Instagram, Twitter. Which, which one are you like is yours? Like the one that you're the most active on these. Days? I would say Instagram, Instagram. Yeah. Okay. So you can find me on Instagram. I don't know why, but I think it's I think it's secretly because the pictures of my cats show up more clear okay. on that and, than and is anything it, else. Is are you the Lorenzo Gomez there? Like what is your yeah, Instagram? Yeah, so tag? my handle is at L Gomez one two three. L Gomez one two three. Yeah. Okay. And so they can they can follow me there. Uh, that, and so I, I post regularly just updates on the book. And so I posted one recently about it. It's coming out in October. So okay. yeah. Any any hints on a topic? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm happy to so so the second book is a mental health book about my middle school. Okay. And uh, so it's Tafoya that you talked about at the start of the program. Yes, yes. Okay. Well, yeah. So I went to school at Tafoya, and, and, and so it's about Tafoya. Yeah, so if you just hopped in your car right now or turned on your iHeartRadio streaming app, uh, you can catch this program in full up on our website at www.cybertalkradio.com. Uh, on Tuesday, September 24th, it'll go up there. It'll also go to every podcasting service on the internet, including Stitchers, which the cool kids use. I don't use that one. <laughs> um, that's too fancy for me. But uh, yeah, whatever podcasting service you use, you can find this and catch the whole thing where you, Lorenzo covers some of the background about Tafoya. So the second book, Mental Health About Your Middle School. Yeah, so so Tafoya is, uh, I didn't know any of this at the time, but I'm, I'm, I'm super fascinated by it now, the environment. So it's it's on the west side. The zip code of it is one of the most economically segregated zip codes in the country and it has been for decades and decades it it sits the school sits uh, it shares the street so it you know, get on the sidewalk cross the street get on the other sidewalk to one of the oldest housing projects in the world the Arizona Apache Courts which Eleanor Roosevelt had to help build because it was a union problem um, at the time that I went there, the largest building in the entire area was Bear County Jail. So you could see this building from everywhere. Every every from every class I had, I could see it for the most part. A um, couple other things about the, the the neighborhood: the Peace Corps used to send people there to stim- to simulate third world poverty before they send them abroad. And so, and then and at the, the time that I was there, which was the early mid nineties, San Antonio, the city, was going through an eight year its highest surge eight years of gang violence and drive by specifically. And so my neighborhood, which was not near Tafoya, uh, was the second hottest spot for drive by shootings during that time period that like they, they had to park a police, uh, a camper, uh, headquarter to monitor the, my neighbor, the, my street. And so the book is basically about all of the things that 12 year old Lorenzo witnessed during those very formidable times. So what I do for the reader is, you know, I try to make it really, you know, good storytelling. So it's captivating. But what I do so that it's not just a sob story of, you know, you know, traumatic events is after every chapter, I write a letter from adult me to 12 year old me. And each letter contains at least two or three mental health principles. And so these are principles that I learned in therapy that I've learned through researching therapy. Uh, Specifically, I pull a lot from, there's a very famous form of psychotherapy called TA, transactional analysis. And so I have a lot of TA principles in the book, but the reader won't know it. So you're going to get to a letter. The letter will technically be about negative self-talk, but I tell the reader, this is about the power of words, and the story that you tell yourself, right? And so uh, so let, let's talk about it, safety in the environment, things that you don't get to pick. So I hope that the reader is not uh, enjoys a good story, um, but they don't know that they're getting mental health principles in these letters. And so that is the core of the book is anybody that's dealing with fear and anxiety will hopefully be able to take something away from it. Oh, it's, it's good. I mean, regardless of, of where you're at and where you're coming from, um, there's imposter syndrome, people yes. fear and anxiety everywhere at every level. Right. 
Um, like I was just uh, reading a, a book, and I'm going to forget the the author. Um, it was a, a resident advisor, though, at Harvard for a number of years mm. while he um, got his Ph.D. there and became a, a professor eventually. He may be teaching there. He may be teaching somewhere else. But his thing for, like, freshmen at Harvard in that resident hall he got everybody down the hall, and he said, look to your left, and then everyone look to your right and realize that half the people in this room are going to be below average at the end of the first year, and none of you have ever been below the top 5% of your class and most likely <laughs> not the top 1% of your class mm. of all of your peers before. And you're, half of you are going to have to learn this year how to deal with being below average for the first time in your life. Wow. That, yeah. that is mental health. Yeah, I mean, so, right there. Like, in, 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 at Harvard there, you have 25% of the folks go through a clinical bout of depression during their time at Harvard, and like you would like to think that if you get into Harvard, you've made it. Like right. this is like everyone's like, I'm done. I'm I'm in. This right. is great. Um, but then but, you end up in depression because your frame of reference changes again. It's so fascinating, and I think that you know, I think that mental health is finally having a moment where the stigma is getting removed. I think more people are talking about it. I also think that it for many years has been misbranded as mental health equaled mental illness, you yeah. know, which is not. You know, I, I have a I have a family member who's a paranoid schizophrenic, and so like mental illness is very you know they need medicine. Yeah. Versus mental health, which is like going to the gym. You know, what are the things and exercises and tools? And so that's really what this book is about: is how do I give you tools by telling you this story that you can take with you on a day to day basis? Yeah, it's uh, the mental health stuff is super fascinating to me because yeah, it's totally okay to hire a personal trainer to like get bigger, <laughs> right. big buff muscles right, or right, whatever yeah. else. Washboard abs, yeah. But yeah, not okay. I mean, it's athletes um, have really actually made the mental health stuff more acceptable. You go back to a lot of the training I did was you would meet with a, a coach to deal with it, and a, the, they would call themselves a coach still, not a right. psychologist or a psychiatrist. This right. is a coach that's helping you deal with a slump in baseball or uh, helping you deal with whatever thing you were doing in whatever sport you were playing that was making your performance below where it needed to be from the mental side of the game. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, there's a uh, NBA star, Aaron Gordon, right? He had he uh, won the uh, the slam dunk competition a couple years ago, and he he is uh, one of the things he's famous for is he has a mental health coach that he's had I think since he was like 16. Yeah, and his name's uh, Graham Beckchart, and uh, he you know, he wrote a book called um, Plain Present. But I I just I really love the notion that that this NBA star is very public and proud about having a mental health coach in the same way he had a physical coach. And that, to me, is where we need to go as a, as a community. Yeah. It's like, I mean, if I think back to my golf playing, it's like you sit and think and visualize the shot over and over and over before you actually right. swing and do it. And But doing that kind of mental training in our day jobs, most folks don't do that. They don't, like, if you're going to walk in to meet a new client or a prospect or a customer, right. you don't visualize how that handshake's going to go, how you're going to look them in the eye and smile. Right. Like, people don't do that type of stuff. And then if it's going wrong or things are going bad, they don't go talk to a mental health coach about how to correct the downward behavior if you blew up in a meeting and got angry right. for no reason. Well, and also, you know, a, gr a great coach in the fitness world gives you you know, little exercises and stretches and things to do every day at home. Yeah. And I think that a great mental health coach does the same thing. What are these little tools to put in my toolbox every day so that it's not this dramatic, you know, counselor session where they've got to, you know, exercise my demons. Yeah. Right. And I think that to me, that's what I, I'm very hopeful. And I, and I think it's having its moment. So I'm very happy that the book's coming out at this time where I think the stigma is sort of going away. That's good. So, Writing a book. So this is your second one. And I think a lot of folks are like on this bucket list. I'm going to write a book in my life. And then they do it. And they're like, that was the most terrible thing I've ever done. I'm, <laughs> and I'm, I'm glad I've got it done, but I'm not doing it again. Even more yeah. terrifying than jumping out of an airplane. So what made you decide to write the second book? Well, I, actually, I'm uh, I'm a little I'm a little shy or embarrassed to admit this, but there is a an entire body of work that that I would like to do before I retire. There's about 10 books I want to write. And okay. I know most of their titles already in my head. And so So you got excited after the first one, not terrified. I yeah, I got it well, I got excited because I thought my mom was gonna be the only person to buy ten copies. And when it turned out to be more than ten copies, yeah. I, I just thought, okay, cool, this is this is a, a great way to get ideas out. Yeah, you know, I bought I, I bought about. fifty copies of your book <laughs> yes, for, I, for a bunch of uh high school were, kids that you we were had. an early adopter, but, yeah. which I appreciate. 
No, yeah, it, was, and it, it was a great story to, to <laughs> let these folks know that like, the kids out there, and uh, if you're listening to the program, playing Cyber Patriot and doing these things now, um, yeah, you could be Lorenzo Gomez here 20 years <laughs> from now running foundations and transforming the city. Well, uh, and that was, yeah. you know, Cilantro Diaries, you know, was really this notion of can I get all of the best advice and give it to pay it forward and then also show my greatest mistakes and say, hey, do all these things because someone smarter than me suggested it and then don't do this other bucket of things, which are the things I did by myself. Yeah. And so it's a way of avoid all this stuff and do it the right way. And that was and and I'm very glad that I wrote it that way because it's it's been very helpful to people. That's the feedback that I've received. So I'm really glad that, that I at least executed the, the, the vision. Of it. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us on no, Cyber Talk me. Radio. And uh, for listeners out there, uh, we've been on the air now for about three years. We've uh, all sorts of stuff about building ecosystems, communities, starting companies, talking about nerdy cybersecurity stuff as well, uh, which is the, the really the main topic. But um, on that cybersecurity piece, you've got to bring the rest of these in so that us cyber folks can figure out uh, how to be part of a community and, and get our ideas out and go grow a business.